Good morning. My name is Jane Ranham, and I chair the St. David's Partnership and Child um, Welfare Ministry Team here at Westminster. We have been working with the Westminster Social Justice uh, Ministry Team to bring you today's Social Justice Forum. The theme for this year's forums is diving deeper together so all will flourish. This theme builds on our heightened awareness of the systemic and critical issues affecting our community brought to greater attention in recent years, most especially in response to the murder of George Floyd. Through these forums, we have been learning about longstanding needs and, and are becoming more prepared to support the flourishing of all the members of our community. Today, we are pleased to welcome back Julie Shortall, the Chief Executive Officer of St. David's Center for Child and Family Development. Since the opening of Westminster's new edition in 2018, the second floor of our new edition has been home for St. David's Harmon Center. Julie has served as St. David's uh, Chief Executive Officer since 2010, but during her 28 years at, with St. David's, she has held many roles in direct service, project management, and leadership, invariably focused on our community's most vulnerable children and their families. She has been instrumental in developing, co-developing some of the most innovative programs and collaborative partnerships. Julie received her undergraduate degree in elementary education and her special education certificate from the University of Minnesota, and she and her husband, Dan, are the parents of two adult children. Today, Julie will be discussing the critically important work that is going on at the Harmon Center, the impact of the joint pandemics of COVID-19 and, system, and systemic racism focused obviously on the impact of the murder of George Floyd and the impact it has had on how St. David's meets the needs of the children six and under here at the Harmon Center and their families. She will also discuss future plans for the Harmon Center and its relationship with Westminster. Following her presentation, those of you that are here are welcome to ask questions. Please raise your hand if you are here in person and I will bring the microphone to you. For those attending on the live stream chat, we will monitor the chat and offer your question here in the Meisel Room. And now, please join me in welcoming Julie Shortall. Thank you. Um, I'll kind of step to the side here so you can see me on camera. Thank you so much, Jane and team, for the invitation um, to be here today and for Westminster's continued commitment to the work of St. David Center. As we come to our fourth year anniversary as, um, as an organization having launched in the Westminster space here uh, for St. David Center's clinic focused on children and families who have faced trauma, we, um, our Harmon Center for Child and Family Wellbeing, we remain deeply grateful for the faith, your faith community's commitment to our partnership and to this work. We know that work like this is best done in partnership in the world, and we are so grateful to be in that partnership with the Westminster community. Today's purpose, the, when um, Jane and Elena imagined today's purpose, they asked if, if I would provide an overview of how St. David's Center has survived um, the pandemics, given the environment of the last two years. And so that overview is going to include uh, um, COVID's impact, what, what that did to the organization and how we survived, St. David's recovery in, the, in an impossible environment at times, 
results specific to um, the Harmon Center, the results of our work, and a little bit about our strategic plan, where we're going in the future. So, impact of COVID. I want to start with the big picture. My colleague, Maureen Walsh, is a, a brilliant thinker and strategist and um, learner. She went out and grabbed some data as we um, prepared to present to you today that would share the big picture of how the pandemic has impacted families. And these four bullet points are not new news to any of us. But as an organization specifically focused on young children and parents, already facing challenges due to barriers in their life, due to poverty, due to struggles with development. Um, these um, four statistics are particularly heartbreaking. So imagine being a, a healthcare provider, a nursing assistant as a parent in a nursing home, and doing, um, being an Uber driver for your second job to make ends meet. And then imagine these four these four statements about the economic stress, the economic stress on families, unemployment, uncertain future, housing instability, the emotional distress and social isolation, grief and loss of loved ones, and we just can't overstate the impact that the uncertainty, the unknown pathway of this virus has had on our whole community, but then add in families who are really struggling um, with poverty and other issues in their life. And then parenting school-aged children and the stress associated with online and distance learning and interruptions in childcare. How do you show up for it as an Uber driver and a healthcare provider when your, your childcare is yet on quarantine one more time? So uh, we went out and looked, Maureen went out and looked and said, what does the data tell us? What does the data tell us about families who are facing these kinds of barriers? And it tells us some, it's some pretty hard facts that are out there in the community. So among um, households that with incomes below 35,000, 47% of adults report being behind on housing payments. 200, with families living 250% um, percent below poverty, 44% are food insecure. For mental health, when you look at the mental health of our whole nation of adults, over 50% are reporting that they've had, that's had um, COVID has had a negative impact on their mental health. And then you look again at, um, at families where there is low income, 32% have felt depressed in the previous seven days. And then you look at statistics like domestic violence increased in 12%. And that's um, with just you know the general population of domestic violence, and then when there's a first time incident, an, an even higher increase. And then looking at parents, 71% of parents in the NIH study reported an increase in parent-specific stress before COVID, citing changes in children's routines, worry about COVID-19, and the online schooling demands as most common stressors. So these statistics are sobering to say the least and, um, and hard to look at as we think of the families that we're serving. And then, and then you know, at, at the end of the day, when you look at the, the stressors on families, what does that mean for children? When parents are distressed, if they don't have support, it becomes hard to buffer children from distress. And we also know that when children have unrelenting stress during their, their developmental pathway, when they have unrelenting stress, in literature we call that toxic stress, in literature and research, and that toxic stress changes brain development. So this is some pretty hard news to look at, some pretty hard statistics. And this list of um, what happens with children under stress, this is the list of sort of consequences that we see. We don't see the consequences inside their bodies. We will see that over time. As a nation, we're starting, we won't know for sure the impact on, on children and adolescents for some time. Even without the pandemic, research shows that one in five children experience a diagnosable behavioral health concern, and half of all mental health issues begin by age 14. So states are starting to study, with that in mind, states are starting to study across the country what the impact the pandemic is adding to these very hard statistics. 
it's a pretty grim list. That said, I was thinking about it this morning and thinking, what gives us hope in the midst of these hard and sad statistics? And since I'm um, in a church and um, with you, um, the, all that uh, that honor uh, a God of the universe, I thought I looked back on, on thinking about what do we know that Jesus did when he was on earth? He looked at the, he knew these big global data points. He talked to the human race over and over again in, in his sermons. But that said, Jesus met each person individually and as though they were the only person there and met them inside of their story. You know, you think of the woman at the well and how he just met her and offered healing and hope and a path forward. So in that spirit, we stay the course of our calling. And thinking about St. David Center's calling to build relationships to nurture the development of every child and family, we have been determined in the midst of the, the environment of the last two years to stay the course of our calling. Just to show up for those families, to stay tethered in whatever way we could, and to um, provide services that would meet their needs and wouldn't abandon them during um, just such crisis in our community. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that has looked like. So I'm going to step back. I'm going to I'm going to tell you about it in kind of four ways. First, just how the organization has survived. Second, what have services looked like through the pandemic? Third, what has been the impact of those services? And then lastly, I'd just like to tell you a couple stories that are specific to the Harmon Center so that you can have a sense of what's happening in, as a result of the commitment you've made to St. David Center's mission. So thinking back to 2020, in 20, March 2020, we had our big Make Them Shine gala in early March. And then about a week later, the whole world shut down. And um, just to put it in perspective, what, what our concern was as an organization, most as an as a early childhood, most of our work being in early childhood services, much of it, and then some in elementary years, most of our work is in person. We had done very little telehealth. Um, we had set ourselves up to start evaluating a telehealth model, but had done very little. So... Um, when the world shut down in March 2020, St. David's Center experienced an immediate drop in engagement. We all went home and shut our doors and tried to figure out what was next. We had a, an, an immediate drop in fee-for-service revenue. About 75% of our revenue is fee-for-service revenue, meaning if clients don't show up, we don't have any revenue. We had immediate need to, to pause and reinvent our service delivery. So in March of 2020, I um, asked my leadership team to close down everything they were doing, step back, gather a handful of people, and reinvent our services, reinvent uh, through a telehealth model, an in-home model, and an in-person service model, saying what would it look like if we we re-engage our services because we cannot abandon families in this time. What, what does re-engagement look like? And I had this incredible creative leadership team that stepped back with, with their people and really fully reinvented our services. We developed a preparedness plan. We really didn't even know much about COVID at the time. Um, and then we, um, we really had to pay attention to what our workforce needed in order for them to show up well during the pandemic. And that takes us to, um, uh, well, I'm going to step back before I, I talk about what happened. So when we, um, when we uh, did our first run of financials, so part of the the issue at play here is in order for St. David's Center to be to survive and be ready to provide our missional services, we needed to survive financially. And because 75% of our revenue was fee for service, when we had to look and say, what will happen if for the next three months no clients show up for services? Even if we open our doors, what will happen? And our CFO did a, a run of our financials, and we were looking at between a three and a nine million dollar loss. And just knew 
that that was not acceptable. We, we can't do it that way. We, we will be underwater and um, the organization will close. So our, the, you know, we huddled meeting after meeting to try to make determination on what was next. And our CFO also said, she said, Julie, if we don't make very fast, definitive decisions right now, we won't be able to catch up. So very early in the pandemic, we decided to furlough uh, a 200 of our staff. We we looked across the organization. We knew we wouldn't have front desk open. We we would you know anything that was that we anybody that we thought we can do it without. We had to furlough. And part of my concern as the leader of this organization, I wanted my staff to be the first to get on un knowing unemployment would be available for thousands upon thousands of people. I wanted my staff, if we were going to put them on unemployment, to be the first in line. I didn't want it to run out on them. And so we put 200 people on, on furlough, and we reinvented our services, and we said, we will call you back as soon as families are, as soon as we have some level of confidence that families are going to accept services. And the good news is we reinvented some really wonderful services. Our team created a cohort model, a really strong preparedness plan. We put all that under, in place. And we ended up um, really experiencing some really good improvement that was unanticipated. And it was a number of factors. So if you look at this slide, and I won't linger here too, uh, too long. I want to make sure I get to the results of the services. But if you just look at this slide to look at our financial recovery, in early 2020, we looked like we were going to have about a $23 million budget. When we when we did a reproject and after, after we made a number of difficult decisions, we it looked like we were going to be at more like 15 million and with about a 1.6 million dollar loss. And our attention then went to how can we recover that kind of loss? It's not three million, it's not nine million, but 1.6 was still a hard loss to experience. And then we just started running after a number of strategies, including looking for federal funding, state funding, and county funding at every turn. And we ended up with um, a fiscal year end of really break even, of nine, really kind of coming back to almost 20 million in revenue and 20 million ex in expenses. And that was a great story. And that came as a result of this list of factors. We were we um, put together this modified center-based service delivery um, strategy, and families returned in droves. As soon as we opened our doors, families had trust that the organization was going to provide service as well, and you know they just came back and and said, "Yep, we're going to trust you, and we're going to figure this out together." So modified center-based service ramp, there was just a wonderful uptake. We knew that families, they said telehealth is okay, but we know our kids need to be in person. Their development will slide without it. We had, and we started a, a really strong telehealth program and found that there was just this r tremendous uptake of services. So it's fa those families who couldn't show up or our staff who couldn't provide in-person services, families said, yep, I will show up day after day for that telehealth service. We served over about 150 of our staff provided telehealth over 2020, serving over 1,000 families in, in a telehealth um, modality at various times. Um, we had in-home services could be provided by some of the family members, so we were able to keep them in their very strict cohorts. Our county and state contracts stayed in place. The county and the state remained really strong partner. They said, you just re redesign as you will. Our grants are not going away. We know you're showing up for those families. Keep doing your work. And then we were able to do some things like defer unemployment tax um, so that we could stay in a strong cash position. Yes? So maybe you're going to cover, maybe you're going to cover this uh, in, in a subsequent. Maybe you're going to cover this in a subsequent session. Let me know. But I'm really curious about how that cohort model works. Could you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the question. The, so our, um, when we started the pandemic, we had a pod model where we would have just one hallway was a pod. And we realized we needed to just be in very strict cohorts where staff were not crossing over from one group to another. So let's just take Harmon Center, for example, here in Westminster. We have a 
family place classroom, and we have an autism day treatment classroom. And um, we have a morning group and an afternoon group. And those, those teachers and those kids don't cross paths. They stay very strictly in their group of six children and three or four staff. And so staffing that became a very uh, uh, in a difficult strategy because we'd have, you know, if somebody was sick, if we needed a sub, we'd have to have a sub that didn't cross over to the other cohort. We just were very strict so that we were not infecting. If we got an infection in one group, it didn't cross over to the next group. So we did that both here at the Harmon Center and we did it at our, our larger campus in Minnetonka. We had probably 20 cohorts going at once, just not crossing over one another. So it became... Uh, a good strategy and an expensive one. So making sure that we were getting, which takes me to my next point, you know, making sure we had a good rescue campaign in place became critical. We started telling our story to the community and looked at, um, advocated, we, um, St. David Center um, put together a group of other nonprofits, other large nonprofits, because so some of the federal funding wasn't available to us. We were over 500 employees, and a lot of the federal funding, especially the PPP loans, was for um, organizations under 500. So I, pu I, we put together a group of large nonprofits and started advocating with our legislators. Senators like Tina Smith um, took meetings with us, and we just said, we want you to know our story. And we are Catholic Charities, Lutheran Social Services, St. David Center, Frazier, big organizations. We said, we're, we're the, the, our state safety net. You do not want us to fail. And so we started getting some leverage with those conversations, and some of the rescue funding became available to us, which was a, a saving grace in this very, very difficult year. So, um, you know, and then as, as, our, um, as our service uptake started changing, we were able to align our, our um, staffing structure with services and, so, and with anticipated revenue. So that brings us to the, um, a little bit more on the impact of COVID on our staff. 400, we had 545 of staff before COVID-19. Right today, we have 488, so we're almost back at where we were with just some mild, you know, changes across the organization. Leadership and most tenured staff have stayed stable, which has been really a lovely statement to make and which has, and has provided great stability for our whole staff. We are feeling, like everyone in 2021, the impacts of the great resignation, which also is, I've heard, defined as a great reshuffle. Staff moving from one organization to another, we have felt that impact and are really trying to mitigate against it and, and be an uh, employer of choice. Um, we've engaged in very deeply in diversity, equity, and inclusion work. In the midst of the double pandemics in our world, that work became so critical in this year. We were already on that path, and we went even deeper with it in this year. And I would say, as I, um, at, uh, I said to some of the people in the room at the beginning, <clears throat> how are our staff? They are deeply committed, and they're tired. It has been a hard two years. Many of our staff have been providing in-person services for two full years and are masked and in and out of quarantines and have their own children. And so it's not been easy, but they have done so because of how deeply they believe in the work and the mission of St. David Center. So what, what else is inside of our results? Over 4,000 clients were served through a pandemic, which I... If, if you had asked me in March of 2020, could I say that? I would not have said it with confidence. To see my our team just reinvent St. David Center's work and respond to a, a strong preparedness plan and start telehealth and get creative, to see that take place and then to, to see that 4,000 children and families were touched. We ended the year with a small surplus. A majority of our work Force, um, furloughed workforce returned. Those who didn't return were um, needed to stay home with their own kids or had moved on to something else. So we were able to offer jobs back to everybody who was ready to come back. And we now have telehealth as a key tool to increase access. So when we are in a quarantine, we're able to offer uh, telehealth to that cohort group pretty immediately. 
and looked, we're looking to the future to how it might inform some home programming as we go forward. So on to the Harmon Center. What, what has happened at the Harmon Center, the Harmon Center for Child and Family Wellbeing Context? You know, I think some important things to note is that the ongoing stressors and adversity in the lives of many of the families served here is are very real. You know, just to take my example person at the beginning, a nursing assistant in a nursing home and an Uber driver, that is a very real human that has kids in our programs here. The murder of George Floyd in 2020 just left downtown as a ghost town. My staff described coming down here, and we have a, as you will know, we, we have a staff, um, a significant staff of color here in downtown Minneapolis, and so George Floyd's murder is very personal to them. It's not just a, a community struggle, it is a struggle for them personally. And so, you know, to be downtown and to have um, to have it feel like a ghost town and to see it all boarded up and um, and then to have the trial taking place when they were down here providing services, that was very challenging. We closed a number of days in anticipation of the trial and the day that the that the verdict came, we were all on alert, ready to, to send kids home. And just a reminder that many of our kids that come to Harmon Center come on Medivans. So their parents might not be able to drive them here. So they, you know, so we were always thinking about, you know, is it safe to have them come down in a Medivan um, with, without a parent in place? Are our staff safe coming down here? So we were in very real time from week to week making decisions. There is barriers for those families in access, accessing telehealth, challenges to care, caregivers to implement strategies at home. So in response, we, um, we minimized when we could. We eliminated barriers to engagement by truly meeting um, those families where they were at, providing additional supports, IT solutions where we could, um, individualized the pace and intensity of services to each family to, in order to uh, really meet them where they were at and engage them wherever they were in that moment. And then invested in play therapy materials, including toys and games, to increase our clients' motivation for engagement. You know, thinking about being on the other side of a screen, they needed toys that replicated what they had here. Thank you, Westminster, for your generous um, support as we were trying to just put together our telehealth model and we needed toys for all those kids in their homes. And then we partnered with Natural Supports and Families Lives. And then as they were ready, welcome um, parents and children back into services after breaks. Yes. in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Could you maybe just give an example of some of that? I sure will, yeah. So um, we had a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee that had started a few years before this. They, A staff group came to me and said, we want to start this initiative. Will you get behind us? And I, of course, said 100% behind you. And they, they said, we want it to be staff-led. We want leadership to show up. And um, and yet, um, you know, just having it come from the staff community felt great, and it really came from a place of them wanting to be sort of clinically informed about their work. That said, we had, start, we had started several initiatives that had a, um, a consultant work with us, had a staff team that really grew and became... Um, became really uh, kind of a learning community around diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we hit the, the um, year 2020 and George Floyd's murder took place, I just found myself in just such feeling both gratitude and humbled and um, afraid about how do we lead through this as a white woman? How do I lead my community through this when I I don't do not have their lens? I do, I have not lived in their shoes, and um, so we we just said let's have this be a year of learning, 
And so we, we had um, formed a leadership group, uh, a staff leadership DEI group, three people that work in different roles across the organization. And we said, can each of you lead some form of learning where we just open it up to our staff to be in conversations? So we had a podcast group, a work group, an article group, and uh, um, a movie group. And they they would this group would just put out to our staff community say we we're, we're going to watch this movie and just get together and talk about its impact and think about how we want to um, go deeper in our learning as a community, and it was astounding to me how well attended those those sessions were. Staff from across the organization just showed up for meeting after meeting virtually, of course, and just I think it, we were all hungry to learn together and we were also hungry to be together and to be together in the conversations that, that would help us go deeper in our understanding. So we went from that, we did that for about a year, and then we moved to just holding um, listening sessions. And our leadership team, our staff leader, DEI leadership team just holds leadership se sessions monthly and just says, show up for whatever you wanna talk about, and we're gonna just be in that conversation together. So that's that's a lot of what our work looked like in the last couple of years. We also have a number of bigger strategies we're working on, on, on um, hiring, wanting to really increase our diversity on our team, on de evaluating policies and procedures so we're sure we're, they're inclusive, and, um, and just really looking across ways we can, we can shape the organization's future. So, so that's just a little picture of that. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go to the next slide here and just show you some numbers at Harmon Center. Uh, it's Harmon Center's results. So, uh, we remain the only multi-service early intervention center in the Twin Cities that's dedicated specifically to trauma, to children who have faced trauma. I think Westminster should take great pride in that. It's a, it's really important work, and we've been able to stay the course of that work because of your commitment. In 2020, we served 288 kids. In 2021, 290. So really continuing this, this strong and good work. Great outcomes. 86% of the children made significant progress toward their developmental goals. Um, and 95% of the clients with a treatment plan during this time frame achieved at least one goal with 43% achieving more than 10 goals. So just some really, you know, some really good data points that says we're in this good and important work. Um, we, we, we remain a strong referral source for 40 different organizations across the community. And what I'd want to pause and say here is it's, it's, uh, these are all good statistics, but it's in each person's story that it really matters. And thought I would just pause and tell you a couple of stories of clients that received um, services at the Harmon Center. One of them is, um, it just shows the dedication and um, the, the dedication, the resiliency of a family, the dedication of the staff, and the creativity that's had to be employed as we have um, worked through this pandemic. One of our staff, Mel, who is the program director of our family place um, classroom, so children who have mental health diagnoses um, as a result often of trauma and adversity. Mel sees kids individually too, and one of the kids that she was seeing, her family just could not get um, the, this little girl's family could not get her here for services. And the, the mom is an Uber driver. And she said, I, you know what, the best I can do, I can't even do telehealth at home, but I'll, I, we can do it in, in my Uber car. So, yep, so Mel would um, sit on the phone, would sit behind the screen on the phone with that little girl and be tethered to her in the way that that family could show up. And it, you know, I think what it represented to the family is kind of our lack of judgment around, you know, you have to do this a certain way. And uh, a staff's flexibility and genuine dedication to show up in whatever way possible. Another story is of a little boy who is in our Autism Day Treatment Program, our East African Autism Day Treatment Program. He um, is uh, kindergarten age. And as you know, Minneapolis Public Schools was, on, was in virtual learning for the whole year. So imagine being on the autism spectrum, being in, in virtual learning and uh, you know, already struggling with your um, ability to take in the world the way a child who's typically developing is. 
and then being in virtual learning, not ever being in person. And on top of that, this, this little guy, his mom has deep mental health issues and um, left the family at some point during 2020. His, um, his dad tried to show up the best he could in parenting, and they had a very tragic drowning of his, of his little brother drowned in the bathtub. So our little guy, I'll call him Amin, our little Amin was um, five, six years old, struggling to understand the world. Mom's left, dad's there, dad's struggling, and little brother dies of a drowning. Can you imagine the pain of that little guy? And um, kids ended up being removed from the home as a result of that drowning, and he moved in with an aunt who was able to provide stability. He and his other sibling moved in with an aunt who was able to provide stability. And my staff said, <laughs> we're leaving a spot open for him. He couldn't show up for many months because of all the instability. And, you know, we have a waiting list. And they said, we're not going to fill that spot. I mean, needs to come back here. And Amin came back in the fall of 2020, and my staff described the day he walked in the building and with his brand new backpack on, dressed, you know, in his school clothes, and um, just beamed at the sight of a place that had provided him stability. He saw Nick as one of our therapists, um, our speech therapists. He saw Nick and said Nick's name, and he struggles to be verbal. And so to he saw Nick, and he saw his spaces, and just like was pointing at one thing after another. And that is the kind of um, work that has been done here at the Harmon Center over the last couple of years. So with that in mind, I want to talk just a little bit about our future, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Uh, Julie, before yes. you move on, um, yeah. can you uh, make sure that everyone understands what you mean by trauma? What kinds of, give some examples mm -hmm. of some of the trauma that some of these children here at the Harmon Center are dealing with. Yeah. So a, a few things, thanks for the question, Jane. A few things to, to name and what trauma looks like. So it can look like a lot of things. So we know that kids thrive in the midst of um, sensitive and um, consistent caregiving. And when you're a parent that has substance use disorder, it is hard to show up it, as a sensitive and consistent parent. It's, you know, it, so, um, so trauma can look like a child who's living with a parent who is, has terrible addiction and, it, you know, doesn't respond to you when you're five months old and crying for a diaper change. Your, your best uh, tool at five months old is a loud cry to get your needs met, and you have a parent who's passed out on the sofa because of their substance use disorder. That's what trauma looks like over and over and over again. So it can look like, you know, parents that, that lean in and, and be, are really consistent for a while, and then because of addiction um, become inconsistent. It can look like... Um, it can look like parents who are um, who are overly, um, you know, who don't have haven't gotten their needs met as a child, so they can be overly aggressive in their parenting or um, attribute something to a child, a child being a two year old and just being a normal two year old with a lot of a uh, lot of sassiness that parent might consider that bratty or mean and and so then acts out at that child. So it can look like child abuse, it can look like neglect, it can look like parents who just struggle to be available because of their own job situation and then they they place a child, they can't afford childcare and might place a child in a not safe situation in childcare. And we even talk a little bit about how autism can uh, can um, be a trauma for children too, especially if they aren't getting aren't getting responsive services. So there is a whole variety of ways that children um, experience trauma, and over time, if that's a consistent experience over time, it then becomes toxic and changes brain development. So I'm going to say just a little bit about where St. David Center is going. So we've survived the pandemic. We are 
we are strong and, and um, ready to continue, continuing to achieve our mission and ready to look into the future. In 2021, we were in 2020, we were going to develop a strategic plan, and our strategic plan became to survive the pandemic. And in 2021, we said we have to start putting some thoughts down about what have we learned in the pandemic and what is the world calling on from us in the future when we know what our mission and our vision is, what are we uniquely going to position ourselves to do as we go into the future? Our strategic plan is called Meeting the Moment, Shaping the Future. That's what this organization's done for 60 years and we, we will continue to do so. Um, we did an environmental scan to look at what, what's going on in the community and how should that inform what we need to do next. And these six findings were out of our scan. We have, a, I think, like a 10-page report on scanning the environment, but these are the six big findings. One, there is growing unmet need for children's mental health, family support, and child care. So staying the course of our mission and doing some more in that space feels like a critical next step. This next one is heartbreaking, thinking that BIPOC children and families continue to experience worse outcomes. In spite of some of our, our, good, our tr you know, trying here and there, we just have not done enough as a, a greater community. Jane, I think there's a question there. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, black, indigenous, uh, people, of color. people of color, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so they, they continue to struggle. Um, worse outcomes, the data showing in the community. Healthcare, you know, so in spite of that, this next one is sort of a, a hard one to get our minds around as a, a social service agency, but as but in healthcare, we all know that the healthcare sector, sector demands consumer responsiveness and innovation. So we've just been asking ourselves, what does that look like as we look to the future? Um, our organizational knowledge is underutilized internally and externally. So we, we really took a look at, are we doing enough to cross-train one another? Are we providing enough consultation out into the community given some of the secret sauce in St. David's Center set of services and mission and decided we have to do more in that space? And then our workforce, as a general community, our workforce is not aligned with growing needs in numbers, diversity, and preparation. So we really want our giving thought in our plan to how to align our workforce into the future so that we have enough people to provide this important work. And then business model shifts and attention to sustainability and infrastructure are key to our future. So we are going to remain the, the course of our, our three core service areas, inclusive early education, early intervention and treatment. You see that, that more than 3,000 of our clients receive that service from us, home and community support. And then we're developing a, a professional training and consultation model going to, into the future. Our strategic plan is to strengthen relationships, develop skills, mitigate stress, and improve trajectories of more children and families. We want to position St. David's Center to serve more children and families into the future and really thinking about what a measured approach to growth will look like. And doing so through six big strategies. We want to lead in the field really advance the field of early intervention and treatment, making sure that we're doing things like internship programs and mentorship, and um, looking at some statewide initiatives that we can, be, we can be part of, really spreading the word across the community. We're setting our team up to be thoughtful about innovation. We're going to continue to really deepen where we can the partnership models that we have. So places like Westminster, we're also in schools like Osseo and Hopkins schools and Hiawatha academies, our mental health staff saying, what more do you need from our team to make sure kids are getting their needs met at those partner locations? We're going to expand. We've made a, a goal of expanding in, um, in the next five years, perhaps some outstate sites. Um, the, the state has asked us to, to look at whether we could do an outstate site um, in, in the Austin area. So there's just some evaluation. We're putting some lines in the water around where we could think about expansion with some careful thought to that. And then just making sure we're paying attention at every turn to what does it look like to have a to be a mission organization and build a good, strong, sustainable business model and build the right infrastructure so that, that work can take place well. So that's where we're going, and um, I look forward to hearing your 
thoughts and questions? Um, first, I'd like to just share a comment that came in on the chat. Um, I'll just read it direct. Thanks, Julie, for sharing these stories. I'm so honored to be in a partnership as a member of Westminster. Your services are exemplary of what families experience trauma need. And this is from a person that works in social services. So wanted to pass that on. Thank and you. then I have a question, and that is related to the partnerships. And um, you know, through all of this work, I can only imagine the extent of the importance of partnerships. And you mentioned some of the schools. Could you maybe give some examples of how that works and um, so, uh, kind of helps build up what you're doing? Absolutely, yeah. So um, we have, uh, we say we have two campuses and 30 partner locations and hundreds of families' homes that we go in. So those partnerships can uh, have a variety of, um, of, they look as as deep as the partnership we have at Westminster Presbyterian Church, and they can look like um, a co-located services with other um, child care centers or, um, or school districts. So we have a state grant to provide co-located mental health services in Osseo and Hopkins schools. So I have about I want to say right now it's about 12, and we're probably going to grow to, to more like 16 to 18, 12 mental health staff who actually, they are employees of St. David Center, and they get supervision and support from St. David Center, but their office is in Osseo or Hopkins schools, and they have a full caseload of staff that they, or of clients that they provide services to right in school, and sometimes they'll go into those families' homes, and then they provide consultation to the teachers as the teachers are really, as we know, our teachers are, are, have been heroes through this pandemic and are really struggling with kids who are struggling. And so our staff are on site there providing um, clinical direct service to the kids and consultation to teachers. Uh, another question uh, that follows up on that one. Um, there may be people in our live stream audience that really are either new to, to Westminster or is not as familiar with the partnership that Westminster shares with um, St. David. So can you give, can you tell the audience a little bit more, uh, give examples of how the work that you're doing at the Harmon Center is enhanced by your partnership with Westminster? Wonderful, yeah, absolutely, Jane. So um, when we were invited in 2016 to submit a proposal, um, we um, we're in, you know the question sort of was what would you do if you were given this space if you were right and what what would it look like and how would you engage with us and as a church community as a faith community and um, you know our answer was we would absolutely in downtown Minneapolis to have a multi-service a uh, multidisciplinary. Um, clinic that's focused on kids who have faced trauma, where we can provide day treatment services for kids with mental health needs and, and autism, um, and where we can provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one clinical services to kids who are, who need a, uh, you know, kind of a shot in the arm developmentally, and so they need some speech therapy or whatever that looks like. So we proposed that, that idea, thank you, and, um, and we, we said we would welcome um, being in, in conversation with you. We would welcome um, thinking out loud together about ways to engage around advocacy. We'd, we'd um, welcome looking together at the, the broader community and sharing our story together. And um, I know Jane and team, Jane formed a team that really has taken um, taken St. David's Center under your wing and also kind of looked at the broader, it, the broader community and your mission to serve the broader community. And we have felt so um, cared for and um, nourished by that partnership. It's anywhere from providing, you, you all have provided our foster care, 
um, dinners for our foster families. You provided a uh, lunch for our staff. You have um, last year in 2020 when you, Jane, you called us up and said, what can we do for you? We said, our kids need toys in their homes. And you provided toys. You you gave a grant that we could go out and buy toys to, to so that those kids could be in telehealth successfully. So it's looked a number of different ways. But both the staff here and your your volunteer team have been um, have just have um, lived out that partner partnership in a variety of creative and sensitive ways. You know, I think when we first started, we thought, well, maybe we could have you volunteer in classrooms and that kind of thing. And given its treatment, that's been a little trickier. But um, but the you embraced all the other ways that that could look as as we've moved through our partnership. Since we just maybe have time for another question, um, there are children who are either um, who are victims of trauma, who are either in foster care or at high risk of entry into foster care. Can you share with the the audience what percentage of the children that and families that you serve might fall into that category? Hmm. That's a great question, Jane. I'm not um, equipped with that statistic today. Um, I would guess in, in any given time, I, you know, let me guess about 20% or thereabouts. Um, we, as you know, we have had a, a foster care placement and licensing part of the organization for several years. Um, and we decided in 2021 to, um, Hennepin County's really moved to placing children um, who are in need of out-of-home placement rather than in a licensed foster home. They've, they've moved toward placing kids more with kin. And so we decided that it was time for us to step back from placing kids in foster care and have just offered to the county, said, we have services that are, um, that can continue to be available to you. And if those, those families that are all of a sudden were auntie or grandma and all of a sudden now our parent, we are very happy to engage in um, in partnering with you to, to help coach those um, new, new uh, grandmas that now become moms for a period of time. So we're just in very active um, relationship with Hennepin County about how we can support them as they continue to um, evolve their services. Any other questions? Okay, I think we're gonna wrap here. Thank you everybody for joining us and Jane for the invitation. Thank you, Julie, for sharing your insights and perspectives. And um, we, uh, we think it's so important for the Westminster family to understand what's going up on the second floor, especially during these COVID days when um, people don't ne necessarily aren't downtown. Next Sunday, if you, I'm sure you um, enjoyed this, um, this forum, and next Sunday's uh, will be another joint venture that we're doing with St. David's staff. Um, we'll be welcoming um, not only Lisa Brenham, who is a senior director at the Harmon Center, but also Diane Halsey, who is senior vice president of family engagement for Think Small, which is a nonprofit here in the Twin Cities area that focuses on high quality um, childcare. Um, the two and and. Um, uh, a couple of interesting facts about Diane Halsey. She's a member of our partner church, Liberty, uh, and is also the host of Early Risers, a podcast offering to, uh, tools for raising children who understand cultural differences, race, and imply, implicit bias. And I will also tell you, some of you may have heard her and just don't recognize her name, but she's been on NPR with Carrie Wurzer talking about some of these uh, these. Um, intersections that are important. Next Sunday, they will be talking both specifically as it relates to the impact of the twin pandemics of COVID and racism, um, but 
and, and but also uh, Diane will be talking about more in general in our Twin Cities community, what's happening in those areas. So I encourage you to come back next Sunday and thank you again for being here today.